Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out in uh, rather large numbers. And we have a pretty exciting speaker today. Our speaker is an English journalist and author, and I'd like to start by thanking him for being here with us to speak with us because he's taking his time, his own time off, to uh, to come and do this. Um, yeah. Please. So for the few of you who don't know him, um, he is in the uh, Middle East correspondent for The Independent, which is a uh, newspaper in Britain. He was in Portugal after the Carnation Revolution. He uh, covered NATO's war in Kosovo. Um, since 1976, he's been residing in Beirut. And he's covered the Lebanese Civil War. He's covered the Iranian Revolution of 1979, the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, the Soviet War in Afghanistan, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and probably a lot of other things I'm forgetting to mention. Um, and so without further ado, actually, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Fisk. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming on a cold night. I should perhaps warn you that yesterday morning I was on Radio Canada in uh, Montreal and uh, I said that I thought they should go ahead with the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> but let the French win. <laughs> and this went down very well with uh, francophone listeners until I said that I had an article in this morning's Independent that's a little bit more um, critical of the Quebecois point of view on the battle. At which point the uh, Christian said to me, and you're escaping to Ottawa tomorrow. <laughs> I said, yes, I am actually. And quick as a flash, the journalist on my right said, uh, what's your hotel? I said, oh, the Chateau Laurier. <laughs> and I realized what I'd said, I've had no phone calls yet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start obviously with Gaza. Um, I don't believe that journalists should go near wars that they can't cover. And I was not prepared, for obvious reasons, to sit on what my colleagues called the Hill of Shame, two kilometers away from Gaza, uh, t surrounded by Israelis who wouldn't let my colleagues enter the city, where they stood, some of them, I'm ashamed to say, in flak jackets, pontificating about what they couldn't see. At least Al Jazeera International, and at least um, Al Jazeera Arabic were getting out pictures and text. And I'll tell you later why I think that for one reason only, that... Uh, that Israeli restriction on the Western press had a good outcome, and that is it allowed for the very first time in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict for Palestinians to be reporters unencumbered by the false balance of Western reporting. They could tell their story from the streets, and no one could stop them. And that was one of the best, only good outcome from Gaza. I don't think there's any others. However, I wrote about it constantly politically, and I wrote from a very dangerous country called Canada, and I'm going to tell you why it was so dangerous. <clears throat> I was in Vancouver, I was in Toronto, I was in Montreal, and I continued my journeys. But I found a very strange thing. Everywhere I went, I found in the newspapers that I was asked what it would feel like to be in Vancouver under rocket fire from Hamas. <coughs> Listen to this. Maybe you have a home in, Van in South Vancouver, and militants living in Richmond are lobbing rockets every day across the Fraser River. Already they've destroyed the homes of your neighbours, taken out the food court at the Oak Ridge Centre, levelled a nearby elementary school, damaged hundreds of tombstones at the Mountain View Cemetery and flattened the Van Dusen Bot Botanical Garden. When I got to uh, Toronto, I opened the, Globe, the National Post, of course, <laughs> and what do I read? Suppose you lived in the Toronto suburb of Don Mills, <laughs> and people from the suburb of Scarborough, 10 kilometres away, were firing 100 rockets a day into your yard, your kid's school, the strip mall down the street and your dentist's office. What's this guy, this Lorne Gunter? What's he got against the people of Scarborough, for God's sake? <laughs> then I arrive in Montreal, and what do I find? Perhaps you live in Montreal. Perhaps you live in the Outremont neighbourhood, and your children have weekly emergency drills because people who hate you, absolutely blindly hate you, and everyone from your community are launching missiles by the score into your cul-de-sac and the nearby playground, and they've been doing it for seven years. This is a bloody dangerous place you live in, you know that? <laughs> then I arrive <coughs> at my hotel in Montreal to pick up La Presse. I actually prefer Le Devoir and La Presse for the simple reason that their syndication service out of the Middle East 
tends to be Liberation Le Monde, who are sane, good, reporting newspapers on the Middle East, as opposed to the Globe and Mail and the National Post, where you have to get the Daily Telegraph syndication or the New York Times syndication, whose reports are incomprehensible if you're in New York, or you get Tom Friedman. Anyway, I arrive there and I... Tom Friedman used to charge $65,000 an hour for lectures. Now I'm told he charges $100,000 an hour. I charge absolutely nothing, but I am prepared to pay $100,000 not to listen to Tom Friedman for an hour. <laughs> but wait, here is la presse. Imaginons un instant que les enfants de Longueuil Vive jour et nuit dans le froid quand le, que les entreprises, magasins, hôpitaux, écoles soient la cible de terroristes localisés, localisés à Brossard. <laughs> That's the University of Sherbrooke, isn't it? <laughs> and so it goes on. Anyway, happily, I'm on my way across the Atlantic en route to Ireland via um, Paris. I'm on Air France. And I open up the next day's copy of the National Post as I'm flying out. And what do I read? Is France prepared to hold its fire if Belgium starts lobbing explosives <laughs> across its border? Anyway, thank God I reached the sanity of Ireland, only to open my copy of the Irish Times in Dublin. And here is a letter. Dear Madam, it's a lady editor. The letter comes from Zion Avroni, Ambassador of Israel, Dublin. And don't laugh. Here we go. The questions I've been asking the Irish people are fundamental to any discussion of Israel's action. What would you do if Dublin were subjected to a bombardment of 8,000 8, rockets and mortars similar to that endured by Israeli towns and cities for eight years? We've, got, we've added it, a whole year's past since I got... You know, there's a long, long flight on Air France from <laughs> Montreal. How, do you how many people here read the Globe and Mail? Hands up and be... It Jesus Christ. And how many people here read the National Post? Mercifully, no, 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 look, there's a few guilty people taking their hands down quickly. How many people here read the Ottawa Citizen? Oh dear, oof. <laughs> this is the paper the Ottawa Citizen had, a wonderful editorial. After the, after the Palestinians voted for Hamas in 2006, not because they wanted an Islamic Republic or to undermine Israel, but because they were, of course, sick of the corruption of the Palestinian Authority, the Ottawa Citizen had a wonderful editorial. Somebody thieved it from me in a lecture I gave the other day that's so good, that said that the Palestinians had made a grievous error, you see, because those pesky Palestinians were given democracy and voted for the wrong people. You know? <laughs> and it said that the Palestinians must be threatened with fresh elections. I, know. I mean, I thought democracy was a door opening. Now it's a menace. It's a threat against people, you see. You didn't vote right. We're going to have another election. And if necessary, a third, presumably, you know. But how do, you, how do papers print this stuff? It's only, it's only less than two years since I opened the Globe and Mail and found an account of the arrest of Muslims in Mississauga colour it green on our colour-coded map, right? This is the famous, was it the Mississauga 11 or whatever, the plot to, 18, the plot to, you know, take over Parliament and chop off Mr Harper's head or whatever else. And um, I, I read on the front page of the Globe and Mail a description of the arrest of two brown-skinned Muslims. That's what it said. Incredible. I cut it out, of course. I don't use email. I don't use the internet. I don't use blogs and Facebooks. Everything is on paper in my archives, and I got it. I picked it up. Next morning, I was on CTV, which, of course, kind of owns the Globe and Mail. And I said, um, before we go on, can I ask why you put brown-skinned Muslims on the front of the Globe and Mail? Is this normal in this, you know, the press in Canada? I said, do you refer to the police chief of Toronto as the white-skinned police chief? For I'm sure he is. Is he not? And of course he is. I know that. You know, incredible. When I took this up with Jonathan Kay, who came... Don't wait. He came to interview me at a restaurant in Toronto and found that I had a tape recorder on the table to interview him. I ran my interview. I ran my interview. For some reason, he didn't run, run his of me. But there we go. And I said to him, can you explain to me how we put, you know, brown-skinned Muslims on the front page of the Globe and Mail? He said, well, it's sort of generic, really. <laughs> I'm sure it is, you know. But here, for instance, I mean, here's the National Post on the 30th of December. You won't laugh at this one. This is a, a writer called... Robert Gassner, Toronto. He has terror seven times in four paragraphs. But the key one, now that Israel has acted with an effective surgical maneuver against Gaza's Hamas terrorists, terror infrastructure, etc., etc., Israel and the rest of the world have the right and the obligation to obliterate every single terrorist in the world. A fairly ambitious undertaking. 
in Gaza, Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, and every country in the West, including those in Canada, who at this very moment are funding global terror activity. And my question is, how can a paper print this trash? I mean, this is, the best French word is infantilism, which I translate as babyishness. It's even worse than, you know, lower down than childishness. And then it is an affront to the brave Canadian soldiers who are laying down their lives when anyone criticizes those trying to destroy the worldwide terror network. So even your dead bodies are introduced into this to support Israel's slaughter of more than 1,300 Palestinians in Gaza, of whom, of course, 400 were children. And here's, here is, amazing enough, here is a National Post editorial. This, this moves into a fantasy world, which I've actually entered in Lebanon from time to time. Israel's opponents have mastered such techniques as digging up graves and stealing bodies from mortuaries to inflate the carnage on the ground. And much of the Western media has reported casualty figures in this way. This is absolute fantasy. We had the same at Kana in 2006, when we had another massacre after the first one in 1996, at which point I remember the Israelis complained that some of the bodies, which I saw, newly killed, fresh blood, had been dug up from a cemetery in Tyre and taken to Kana and left there for us to take pictures of. This is beyond fantasy. And yet, there it is. And how do we report? Here's, here, I just clipped this out of my files. Here's a story from the International Herald Tribune, a recent one, recording how after a, a chase on a highway, Israeli police seized 10 Palestinians and a bomb. They caught a guy on a bombing mission, in theory. Way down the story, in paragraph 16, I find the following. No suspects were seized, but a 10-year-old Palestinian girl in a taxi was killed when Israeli soldiers fired on the vehicle. Now, I don't like journalism school, but in journalism school, Americans are taught you put the big story in paragraph one. A little girl is killed. That is the big tragedy of this story, and it's on paragraph 16. Why? Because she's Palestinian, or because it wasn't the Palestinians who shot her, but the Israelis? I'm sure that was the case. I remember during the 1996 bombardment when an Israeli helicopter fired a missile into an ambulance in southern Lebanon, killing three children and two women. I got all the bits of the missile and took it back to the manufacturer in Georgia, by the way, in the United States. And it became paragraph eight in the story, which began with how many shells the Israelis had fired into Lebanon. There's a problem in all our reporting, over and over and over again. I've said this before in Ottawa and Toronto and other places. When you have reporters who talk about the occupied territory as disputed territory, when they refer to colonies for Jews and Jews only on Arab land as neighborhoods or outposts, when they refer to the wall, which is taller than the Berlin Wall and longer than the Berlin Wall, as a fence, or my favourite is a security barrier. The Sikkerheits, this was the phrase, security barrier, which the East Germans used for the Berlin Wall. And we use it without any thought that this is exactly the word we used to make fun of when the East German government of the German Democratic Republic used to use this phrase about the Berlin Wall. And yet we go along with this. And of course, the reason it is so dangerous, and I've said this before, but those of you who haven't heard me before, I'm going to say it again, is that we become lethal. Because if you believe, and you're living in Brooklyn, you haven't been to the Middle East, and you open your New York Times, if you believe this is about a dispute, something you can solve over a cup of coffee or in a law court, if it's about a neighborhood, you know, like South Ottawa, if it's, or an outpost, whatever that's meant to me, if it's about a fence, something at the bottom of your garden, then obviously anyone who throws a stone must be generically violent. You see, by changing the semantics of the conflict, we make it lethal. We make it permissible to fire back at a stone thrower on the grounds that this is an animal. This person has no way of communicating or negotiating. But if you say, yes, it's an occupation, and it's a wall, and it's taking land, which rightfully, under proper title deeds, belongs to other people, it makes sense. I'm against all violence for any reason ever. But at least it makes sense. You can understand it. You have a context for it. But we journalists, we just let it go. We let it float away, and we don't care. And I think too many journalists perhaps believe that, you know, um, to a job as a journalist is like working in a bank or um, perhaps, you know, teaching maths. It's not a bad thing to do to teach maths, but I think it, journalism should be a vocation. And I, I know that when we go to our first newspapers, I started off on the Newcastle Evening Chronicle where they told you to put the most important bit of the story in paragraph one. They always said, you've got to give 50% of your report to one side and 50% to the other side, to be fair and neutral and impartial. Now, that's okay when I was reporting football matches in Northumberland for the Newcastle Evening Chronicle. 
And it wasn't bad when I was reporting public inquiries into a new motorway in County Durham. You know, you had the government side, the local government side, the protesters, the people who lived in the area. But the Middle East is not a football match. It is a giant human tragedy of great bloodshed. And I believe that journalists should be neutral and unbiased on the side of those who suffer. When, if you were alive, or if I was alive in the 18th century, and we were reporting the slave trade, would we give equal time to the slave ship captain? No, we'd report on the slaves and talk to them. If we were present at the liberation of a Nazi extermination camp, would we give equal time to the SS spokesman? No, we'd be talking to the survivors and writing about the dead. When I was in Jerusalem in 2001 in August, with a tick, tick, tick of the clock, starting for September 11, a Palestinian suicide bomber in King George V Street walked into a pizzeria full of Israeli children. I was just down the road. I got there, I saw an Israeli child with no eyes, an Israeli woman with a chair leg through her. Did I give equal time to the spokesman for Islamic Jihad? No, I did not. And when I was at the Sabra and Shatila massacre, climbing over corpses to get stories from people who were still alive, did I give equal time to the spokesman for the Israeli army which sent the murderers into the camp? No, I did not. So I think that neutrality and unbiased reporting is essential, but it must be on the side of those people who suffer. We have a morality, or we think we do, we feel we do. You have feelings of morality. If you see an atrocity, you're outraged by it. We should be outraged by it too. Not sitting on a hill in a flat jacket two kilometers away making excuses for one side or both sides. I'm not a great fan of Hamas, by the way. You know they killed more than 40 supposed collaborators, some of whom would have been. There was a forest of spies in Gaza. That's why the Israelis killed so many Hamas people. But when they've killed more than 40, and you reflect that only 13 Israelis were killed, and four of them were killed by their own soldiers, Hamas was not fighting a very dramatic conflict in Gaza, with its forest of collaborators reporting on where they were. Hamas thought it was Hezbollah, and it's not. He thought Gaza was South Beirut or Southern Lebanon, and it's not. And it was a big mistake, and I've seen no forward political thinking by Hamas. I haven't seen a lot by Hezbollah from time to time. Just to make sure we have the uh, department of <laughs> serious affairs here. Um, you know, I, I don't find there's an awful lot of good guys in the Middle East, but I guess that's the reality of having been there perhaps too long, like um, <laughs> 33 years. It'll be on June the 6th this year. I worked out the other day that uh, for an article I was writing, that there are now 22 times as many Western military forces in the Muslim world as there were Crusaders in the 12th century. What on earth are we doing out there? I went to Kandahar in December a few weeks ago, not embedded with the Canadian Army or the British Army or the American Army. I just went on my own. I didn't see a single NATO soldier in the whole of Kandahar. Not in the market. Not even the central square where Karzai's corrupt brother lives. Not in, near the hospital. I went to the great hospital, the big main hospital in Kandahar. I found Taliban fighters with bullets in their abdomen dying in, after fighting with NATO troops. I found two little girls with acid all over them, which had been thrown in their face when they went to school by no doubt some of the Taliban's friends. But most shocking of all what I found was children being brought in by their parents from remote villages looking like skeletons. And I was saying to the nurses, thank God the International Red Cross are the only Westerners who stayed on in Kandahar. Swiss, a Brit, Australian, they're still there, untouched and unharmed. And I went to one of the Afghan nurses, I said, what's wrong with this child? It was being put in an incubator. They were putting three babies in each incubator because they didn't have enough incubators. This is what, how many years? Seven since we arrived to reconstruct Afghanistan. And I said, what's wrong with these children? And she said, they're starving. There's no food in the villages and no money. And I talked to one of the parents. I don't speak Dari, so I had a translator. I said, what's happening? He said, we have no bread. This is a famine. Did you know there was a famine in Kandahar? I didn't know there was a famine in Kandahar. I didn't read it in any paper here or anywhere else. But when I got in the hospital, there were children. Then they're dying because they haven't got any food. I wrote a story that night and I said, you know, Obama wants to send 30,000 more soldiers to Afghanistan. Why not send 30,000 doctors to Afghanistan? Because I've come to the conclusion now, after years and years and years, that militarily, we've got to get out of the Muslim world. We must leave. It is not our country. It is, does not belong to us. We may not... <laughs> we may not like the governments and tribal governments and institutions that are set up in our absence, but it is not our land. I was actually giving a talk on similar lines in North Dublin, Ireland, um, not on this trip where I had to watch out for Hamas rockets landing in Dublin, but <laughs> earlier on. And um, just 
By the way, the IRA did fire rockets over the border into Northern Ireland, but the Royal Air Force did not bomb Dublin and kill 1,300 Irish men, women and children because it would have been a war crime, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Anyway, back to Dublin. I was in North Dublin with my old mate Vincent Brown, a very fine journalist and columnist. He's an Irish uh, republic. He's from the south of Ireland. But he was in Northern Ireland in Belfast when I worked in the north, so we were good mates. And he was sort of being the provocative co-chair with me, you see. And I was doing my bit about how the hell we should get out of there. He said, but hold on, Robert. The Muslims are a threat to us, aren't they? So I let the audience have this silence that you've got. I said, yes, I didn't know the Syrian army was in Dublin. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know the Jordanian army was in London or that the Egyptians had just landed in New York or Washington. You know? like, how did this situation come about? How, how can this stuff appear in your papers? We now live in the Middle East, in a real world of blood, while the world here sees it as a fantasy. Or at least you're told to believe it's a fantasy. People keep asking me, they did this afternoon, they did yesterday in Montreal when I was speaking in French, and you may ask me the same today, what can we do? And I haven't the slightest bloody idea what you can do, because over and over again, I get 250 real letters a week sent out in my mailbag. Real letters, not emails, not blogs, anything else. And more than half invariably say, what can we do? Our MPs and our parliamentarians and the people we send to Congress do not represent us. It's a major failure of democratic governance. I had a US Marine officer came up to me at San Diego, big US Marine base. I, I talk there sometimes. I said, Mr. Fisk, we have a fraudulent democracy. I send off my congressman, he goes to the hill, and he doesn't vote for anything I believe in. What can I do? And I said, I don't know. Actually, what I tend to tell people is join Amnesty International, independent Jewish voices, human rights groups, human rights watch. But I think the best thing you can do, and I'm not advising a tourist trip to Kandahar or Kabul or Baghdad, is go to the Middle East. Those of you who haven't been, I know many of you come from the Middle East, your families do and have been to the Middle East, but those who haven't, go to the Middle East and find out what's going on. Go to Lebanon. I mean, read the papers first, but go to Lebanon. Go to Syria, go to Egypt, go to Jordan. I wouldn't recommend Saudi Arabia. You can go to Kuwait. Oh, you won't find many Arabs in the United Arab Emirates. So everyone I meet there seems to come. Everyone I meet in the Emirates seems to come from Pakistan or India. Occasionally I spot an Arab, you know. Um, but seriously, go to the Middle East and talk to people, and you'll learn what's really happening. You might even find out about famines that our reporters don't tell us about. But then again, on the other hand, when you're all dressed up in military costume and driving around in armoured vehicles, you're not going to see it. And if the soldiers know about it, I don't think we're going to be reporting it. It's a major problem. I never got over the problem of why reporters want to put on military costumes. <laughs> it was a very strange situation in 1990 when Saddam had invaded Kuwait and this vast army of uh, international forces gathered in Saudi Arabia, along with a vast army of journalists, many of whom had never been abroad before. One of them came from middle America, and he came with a complete combat costume and camouflaged boots. He had leaves painted on his boots. <laughs> and those of you who've even seen a picture of a desert will know that there's not an awful lot of trees. You know? <laughs> the funniest thing was that when I got out in the desert, not embedded, but just wandering around on my lonesome, going up and talking to various military units, I found a lot of the Americans were actually writing very good letters home. I let them use my mobile to call home, and, and I listened. And they actually knew what was going on. They, didn't, they thought it was about oil. They got it right, you know. And a lot of the Americans said, you know, do you, don't put my name in it, but do you think you can print this in your paper? It's a very strange situation. All the journalists wanted to be soldiers, and all the soldiers wanted to be journalists. <laughs> and I sometimes thought, we just switch them around. Let the reporters go off and die in the ditches, and we'll have some decent journalists at last, you know. <laughs> I don't, no, that's a lie, I do want to be very critical of my colleagues, but an awful lot of journalists try to do what I try to do. You know, there are a lot of guys out there trying to do their job, but I'll give you an example of the kind of problems they have. I'm very fortunate and very lucky, and I have to say this, I work for a newspaper that has an owner and an editor that insists that that paper prints every word I write, whatever the pressure's on them. When the Israelis and Hezbollah were fighting in 2006, I was in Beirut, and every day I was driving, almost every day, to southern Lebanon, you know, and air attacks, of course, on the road. And I had a Shiite driver, a very fast car. Um, and in the back, I had a colleague of mine from a very well-known American newspaper. Um, that was the Washington Post. <laughs> I think the guy's just retired, so I can get away with this now. But it was a very instructive trip, not just because of the blood and bodies and everything you saw when you got to southern Lebanon, the villages and entire. What was instructive was that about three or four in the afternoon, we'd head back to Beirut. 
And that was about the time that people came into their offices in Washington and New York. And the conversation in the back seat, you'd get the mobile, call Washington, you see. Okay, how the story go today? This is yesterday's story in today's paper, right? But I didn't write that first paragraph. What do you, who wrote? Why do you put a Jerusalem first paragraph and a Beirut datelines? But that was the fifth paragraph. But why did you cut the sentence in half? And so it went on every day, every day, every day. It was being banalisé by editors who wanted to make sure no one complained. And what lies behind this, I'm sure, is the same old lobby groups. APAC, by the way, is not a lobby for Israel. It's a lobby for Likud. But the same lobby groups that will always utter the slanderous, libelous, scandalous lie that anyone who legitimately criticizes Israel must be an anti-Semite. And I think that the people who use these words, like anti-Semite, in England, by the way, we can threaten them with the law, and I do. I get a letter from someone making that kind of comment. I threaten them with a the lawyer if they utter it again. But anyone who calls honorable people anti-Semites is going to make anti-Semitism respectable and shame upon them for it. There are plenty of... There are... There are there are plenty of real anti-Semites out there, and we should all be against them. However, the water is getting muddied by this use of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism. It's become a punctuation mark, like terror, 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 terror. I can't remember which war it was. I was reporting in southern Lebanon with the Israelis, and I actually, the first paragraph said, terror, 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 full stop, new paragraph, now we've got that over. And the readers understood immediately, because readers are smart people. You know. it's, the, it's the politicians who are the problem. Some of them even believe in God, like Tony Blair. You know, there was a very, how can this mendacious, lying man be the peace envoy for Gaza and the West Bank? He's never even been to Gaza. You know? Why? I guess it's because Hamas people don't wear ties. You know? I, there was a very good, I hate to say this, there was a very good article in the London Sunday Times. I say that because it's owned by my most hated papy vor, paper eater, Rupert Murdoch. But it was a good article. And it said, since Tony Blair has such a close relationship with God, why doesn't God give him any advice? <laughs> like, you know, in February 2003, Tony, this Iraq thing may not be such a good idea. <laughs> I concluded that God, God receives advice from Tony. <laughs> I hope he doesn't take it, but I think that's the way, it's a one-way thing, you know? And he runs a faith foundation. Good God is my only reaction to that. <laughs> Let me go back to an Iraqi who asked me a long time ago now in Baghdad. He said, Mr. Robert, can you tell me something? Why are you, he meant military, us, the West, People don't say, why are you Christians? Because I don't think there are any Christians left these days. That's why we always have books called Islam and the West. They never say Islam and Christendom, do they? No. He said, why are you in Tajikistan? I discovered we were. There's a French air base at Dushanbe flying close air support to British troops in Helmand. Why are you in Afghanistan? Why are you in Pakistan? Why are you in Iraq? Why are you in Turkey? Of course, air base for Iraq and uh, Sixth Fleet base of Izmir in um, Western Turkey. Why? He said, why are you in Egypt, which now makes the M1A1 Abrams tank, by the way? Why are you in Yemen? Why are you in Algeria? There's a US Special Forces base near Taman Rasset in the Southern Sahara. Why are you in Qatar, largest US air base in the Middle East? Why are you in Bahrain, headquarters of the US Gulf Fleet? Why are you in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait? And I realized I'd never been asked that before. You haven't ever read that question in a newspaper. I asked it the other day because I quoted this guy. Why are we there? How do we end up like this? In fact, it's a kind of iron curtain. It starts way up in Greenland. The, the, the American forces are in the United Kingdom. They're in Germany. They're in Bosnia, Camp Bonsteel. They're in Greece, of course. So this new iron curtain stretches from Greenland almost to the equator. What's it for? It's bigger and more powerful than the Iron Curtain of which Churchill spoke in Missouri after the Second World War, which stretched from you know, Stettin in the Baltic to, Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. What's beyond it? Russia, China, India? Is there something we're not being told? It is challenging authority. This is what journalists do not do. You know? And, and, and the way, it's extraordinary how there's, there's now this new politesse, this new special politeness you have to have with everybody. I was on a... Um, uh, Al Jazeera International program the other day, and we had an ex-State Department guy on. I was out of Washington. He was too. And he had his, his say for three and a half minutes, and I sat there. It was the same old cliches, you know, spikes, surge of violence, democracy, human rights. And he finished, and I started talking, and he kept interrupting me, you see. 
<laughs> I said, listen, will you just shut up? <laughs> and the guy said, I have never been insulted before so much on a TV show. Well, I said, would you have now? You have now. <laughs> and he shut up and I had my say, you know. But <laughs> if I hadn't have done it, it would just have been a washout. Of course, that was what it was intended to be. I was on a BBC World Service programme after I got back to Beirut, just at the end of the Gaza War. It was going out at night, and thank God it was live. And I had an editor of the Jerusalem Post in Jerusalem, of course, on the other line. And he started talking to me. He was, the whole thing is, how do you make an excuse for the casualties, you know, 100 to 1 in the Gaza conflict? He said, you know, this is about asymmetrical warfare. By the way, I have no idea what asymmetrical warfare is. Does anybody here have any idea? No, they don't. Well, if you do, you can tell me when we have questions and answers if you want to attack me afterwards. Um, and he started saying, you know, it's not a question of numbers. It's not a question of 1,300 pounds. It's not, that's not what it's about. And I said, you know what I said? If 1,300 Israelis had been killed and 13 Palestinians, you would not be making this argument on the BBC tonight. And there was a long silence. And then he said, I feel the death of every human being. And I said, well, it's good to hear. That's really good to hear. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but we journalists don't ask the questions. We don't fight. You know, Amira Haas, that fine Israeli journalist, who, if you don't read, you should for Haaretz. You get the truth in a lot of Israeli papers, which you don't get in American papers. She said to me once, we were having an argument about what was the purpose of a foreign correspondent, and I was saying, we're out there, the first writers of history, very Brit, you know, reply. She said, no, Robert. She said, our job is to monitor the centers of power and challenge authority, especially when they go to war and they tell lies to do it. And I don't think we do that. You know, in 2000 and uh, three in the invasion of Iraq, there was another very instructive moment for me when the Al Jazeera crew arrived back from Basra. And I, I tried to get to Basra, I got halfway down the road, and I was too frightened to write. There were so many bombs dropping on the road, and military vehicles on fire, and an awful lot of buses on fire, and civilians dead. And they got up from Basra with horrifying film and pictures of wounded children and dead civilians, with children in bits, uh, killed and wounded by British artillery, not by the Americans. And there's a system, you probably know some of you, that when in a war there's a syndication system between you know, Reuters and the Associated Press and Al Jazeera and so on, where they all exchange their materials so that everyone has a crack at seeing what they've got. And the Al Jazeera crew I knew quite well. Two were Lebanese, one was Syrian. And they came back shocked by what they'd seen and fearful of the road back. And I don't blame them. I wasn't brave enough to get as far as Basra. I got halfway. I got to Kut al Amara, as far as I remember. And because I was in Baghdad. I wasn't embedded or with the military forces of the West. And uh, they started showing these pictures down the line to London. And a Reuters voice came back down the line. I'd already got my, I was taking notes on what I was seeing the pictures. And a Reuters voice came down the line and said, you know, there's not much point in carrying on sending this to us. We can't show this. See, I, <laughs> I thought, I mean, pulled out my notebook and said, this is the story today, you know. <laughs> we're not going to show it, are we? Of course we're not. And the guy said, you know, it's bad taste. It's not in taste. An awful lot of our viewers are having dinner or, you know, when we're showing the film of the war and this is not the kind of thing they're going to see. It's okay if you find an Iraqi who's obliging enough to die romantically at the side of the road in, in one bit, you know. The price of war, an Iraqi is dead at the side, blah, blah, blah. You can, I, can, I can do the, you know, the subtitling for you. Um, but these crew went on saying, look, look, we've just risked our lives. Just watch a bit more. He said, more bits of children. There was a kid holding his fingers, asking for them to be stitched back on again. He was alive. This is the Brits who did this to him. And the voice came back down the line and said, we can't show this material because we've got to show respect for the dead. <laughs> now, this was very interesting. We didn't show any respect for them when we were, they were alive. We didn't show any respect for them when we blew them to bits. But when they're dead, we have so much respect. You know, call Tony Blair. I'm sure he has a line on this one. <laughs> this is the way in which television is doubly lethal because it makes war not to do with death, and it is primarily about death, not victory or defeat. War is about the total failure of the human spirit. It makes war into a policy option, in which you don't have to look at what we have to look at. You know, after the liberation of Kuwait, it was a liberation. The bodies on the so-called highway of death, and there are an awful lot of civilians among them, by the way, were being torn to bits by dogs. It was lunchtime. They were hungry. I was seeing dogs, you know, with arms going off with the fingers trailing through the sand. They weren't going to eat them. They were eating the corpses. And if you saw what I saw, you would never, ever support a war. Just wars don't exist in my book. I don't know what I'd deal with my dad, who was waiting for the Germans to invade Britain in 1940, but I can't believe in war. I don't believe in war. But you are prevented from seeing that. And in preventing you, television is part of a coalition with government. Because you will not see what 
we are doing out there. How, we don't even know how many Iraqis were killed. Was it 100,000? Was it a million? There may be one or two people here who will, who will put a hand up now, but can anyone in this room name a single Iraqi who's been killed since 2003, with the exception of Saddam Hussein? <laughs> one, uh, two, that's it. That tells you the story. Thank you. Um, that's it, isn't it? You see, they don't, I don't think we care about the people we kill. I don't think we care about whether if they're Serbs or if they're Muslims. I don't think we care much about Israel. War has become a policy option. That's, you know, Blair didn't lose his job because of Iraq. He lost his job because he didn't want a ceasefire in Lebanon. And he tried to use a ceasefire not as a humanitarian gesture to save lives and the wounded. He wanted to make sure there was a good UN resolution beforehand that fitted in with what Bush wanted. So war, so the ceasefire, which is a humanitarian gesture demanded by international law and the 1949 protocols of the Geneva Convention of the International Red Cross, which was based on the Hague Convention of 1908, and he turned it into a policy option. That's what we're doing, and we journalists are involved in doing this. Why, I ask myself, do we put our trust in these people? Why do we put our trust in Obama? Funny thing, I don't know if any of you feel the same. I, I was in Montreal when he was in Ottawa, mercifully. And, uh, <laughs> but I was watching on television, of course. I somehow didn't feel he was very impressive. He didn't come across as a big, strong man for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I don't think he's going to be any use in the Middle East. Uh, you know, when he went on the obligatory trip to what they called the Holy Land in, before the American elections, he spent 45 minutes with the Palestinians and 24 hours with the Israelis. That's the story. That's it. Um, apparently he didn't get on very well with Mr. Netanyahu, so if Netanyahu can form a government but can't bring in Livni and has to bring in Lieberman, it would be very interesting to see if Obama sends his congratulations on the new government. If Lieberman is involved, it will mean that there's a minister who will probably be the minister who has demanded a loyalty test from minorities. I wonder what happened if this country had a government which included such a man. There'd be a lot of problems in Montreal, wouldn't there, in Quebec. But the point I'm making is I don't think Obama is going to help the Middle East. I don't think Hillary Clinton is, because Hillary Clinton is not going to endanger her relationship with Israel, because she wants to be the next US president, doesn't she? There's a problem there. I was very struck by the fact the Fisk archives come out again. Time magazine in uh, February, uh, man, oh, sorry, it's not man of the year, person of the year, I've got anyway, there he is, you see. And he did a big interview uh, with Time magazine, Obama, profile. In the whole of this interview, page after page of it, he made one sentence about the Middle East, which is the most pressing, crucial, bloody crisis in the world. And by the way, why is Mrs. Clinton in Indonesia and not in Palestine? Huh? Yeah. Very odd, isn't it? But nobody on television has said it's odd. And he made one sentence about the Middle East. He was talking about the priorities of his government. I beg you not to laugh as I read you the one sentence in all these pages which Obama devoted to the crisis in the Middle East. Seeing if we can build on some of the progress at least in conversation, that's been made around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will be a priority. <laughs> well, thank God for all those conversations. And all that progress. There is no progress in the Middle East. It is a total, absolute catastrophe and disaster from the Pakistani-Afghan frontier all the way to the Mediterranean. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, and there's been progress. But we've had some conversations about it. It will be a priority. And I love that line, you know, we journalists, we sniff around linguistics. I did linguistics and Latin with my first degree at university. He said, the progress has been made around the Israeli-Palestinian. Like where? You know, I mean, in Washington? <laughs> and he's talking about the Y agreement. I mean, this is, this is, I don't think we're going to get anywhere with this new government. Poor old Arabs who come up to me in Lebanon at dinner parties and say, Mr. Robert, do you think Obama will be... Said, Forget it. Every time there's a new government in America, Democrats, oh, it's going to be okay. It's the same as if you find many, many Arabs in my part of the world, where I live in Beirut, of course, who say, oh, Mr. Bush, this is when George W. Bush did, he's in the oil business, he'll understand us. Oh, please, <laughs> very. Uh, the, and they say the same sometimes about Israel. Say, oh, the Labour Party's in, it'll be okay. I seem to remember that Shimon Peres was the acting Prime Minister of Israel when the Kana massacre took place. I always say to people, the bombs go on dropping all the same. And I have to say, frankly, I mean, I go to Washington, New York a lot. When I go to Washington, it's perfectly obvious. I go to Congress, I go to the Senate. And the motive power of Washington is not democracy, it's there. And it's not human rights, although we distribute packages from our human you know, supermarkets quite willingly. It's about power. It's about political power. 
And that's, what motiv that's the motive power of politics in the world's only superpower. And frankly, it's the motive power of most governments. It's about power, 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 and who has power and who doesn't. And that you have to realise. That's why I think so many people say, what can we do? And alas, I don't really know what we can do. One thing we can do is, I suppose, apart from go to the region, is talk to the soldiers who've been there. I say this for a reason because I've quoted from this letter before in Canada, but um, I have permission from the family of an American ma Marine colonel in Ramadi. Well, he was in Ramadi. He's home now. Um, after he wrote... These are his letters home I have a collection of from Ramadi. And um, he was actually badly wounded by an IED, improvised explosive device, um, not long after he wrote this letter. But he recovered and stayed um, on duty in um, Iraq. Um, I'm going to read you two passages from this letter for two reasons. Firstly, because you won't be reading this in your newspapers, and you should be able to. And secondly, because I don't, although I don't agree with all he says, my God, this guy writes like Joseph Conrad. This is a real writer, as opposed to Tom Freeman and company. <laughs> Here is part of his letter home to his dad in America, explaining how they're trying to get the Iraqis to take over civil government. That was the original idea, remember? We are trying to empower their police to walk alongside the Marines. There is something culturally childish in that understanding of basic Western governance and management that will require immeasurable education and probably several generations to overcome if they find it of any interest. That education is, of course, a choice that they have to make on their own. They are not our people. Our understanding of their tribal governance and its relationship to formal civic management is equally naive and charges our frustration. The problem now is that their every inconvenience has become our responsibility. The, they act as if they cannot comprehend our sacrifices and are thus ungrateful for them. The reality is that they cannot culturally comprehend our altruism or believe our stated intentions. This is what colonial war is about. And he goes on, even though it is not their desire to offend, we are insulted and it bleeds us of affection and tolerance. Liberation will compete with invasion as our legacy, but locally we are ideologically irrelevant. Our presence is mostly only of interest to those who seek to benefit from our contracts and donations. It is a region of people making alliances, business deals, friendships and enemies one day at a time, without a real concept of sustainable services, resources or trust. No future. Just daily survival as they know it. Family and tribe. Our contributions may be counted long after we've withdrawn, but they will not recount the names of the fallen, so many now. He's talking about the American dead, of course. Each wound will be absorbed into the quiet sadness that we allow to pass beneath us as a people and a country. Our loss will have never even occurred to most people here. Isn't that brilliant? But uh, try this. The guy's got a sense of humour. He's writing home to Dad now. It's, the next, it's, a, it's another letter. Uh, telling him about how the Americans are trying to get local government and democracy working. That lovely thing. We always scatter democracy around when we arrive with our Apache helicopters and our tanks. <laughs> it's come kind of sort of parallel things, aren't they? So here he is running to his father about the election. So, what news about the new government, you may ask, Dad? Well, the provisional military governor was replaced by the transitional governor, who resigned under threat and was replaced with another transitional governor. He was then replaced by the emergency appointed governor, who was just replaced by the selected governor chosen by the elected provincial council. He never made a speech or publicised his views, never debated the other candidates, and was not present during the selection, never making an acceptance speech. He was promptly kidnapped by a rival tribe, while his tribe fought another tribe on the Syrian border. The recently displaced emergency appointed governor returned in hopes of regaining his position, but the deputy governor is now serving as the acting governor, while the actual selected governor is in captivity. <laughs> But there was an election, so democracy is in full bloom, I am to understand. <laughs> this guy can write, you know. It's funny, when I read this chap's letters up, this guy's letter, he's a Marine colonel, everybody in the audience claps him. You ought to hear this, you know. <laughs> we are now trying to force the power of decision onto the elected provincial council and the city officials. It is it's a difficult thing to keep myself inactive, inactive in matters of governance here. The instinct to impose order and command the requisite discipline in the Iraqi leadership must be quelled in order to allow sovereign stewardship to develop at its native pace and in a native form. I fight myself to remain insignificant in the process. I haven't the nature for passive observation. 
I share the American fascination with action, and it has consistently betrayed us in our foreign policy. Our continued involvement will continue the state of dependency, and our eventual departure will leave nothing but cosmetic structure here. Iraq will return to what it is. Our common sense is not common to this people, and that understanding must be given proper respect. I do my best, but I twitch with an urge for the folly of intrusion. Why can't you read this in the Globe and Mail or the National Post or any other paper in the world? How come a Marine colonel can write like this and we don't hear it? Because he knows what's going on. He's there. Journalists know what's going on. One of the shocking things I find is that I talk to American colleagues in the Middle East. They know quite a lot about what's going on. Then I open the New York Times and it's just bewilderingly incomprehensible because they're all balancing things and doing 50-50 journalism. I don't know how you deal with that. You know, I just don't know how you get over it. We don't any longer have leaders who plan. I mean, I was very struck when I was doing research for a Churchill Memorial Lecture in London. You have to give the lecture in the cabinet war rooms and the bunker where Churchill spent the nights in World War II to prevent himself being hit by Luftwaffe bombs. And I did a lot of research on Churchill at that time and Churchill before the war and so on. But what I did discover is that in 1941, before the Wehrmacht German invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa in June of 41, when the Wehrmacht was still on the northern coast of France and Britain was still daily expecting invasion, Churchill started a British Downing Street cabinet committee to organize the running of post-war occupied Nazi Germany, four years before the end of the war. The next year, with Churchill's inspiration behind it, Cambridge University started courses for British civil servants to learn how to run occupied Nazi Germany. Three more years of the war still to run. And when the British went into uh, Cologne at the end of the war, British civil servants in flak jackets went with them to set up, under fire, the first civilian government. For four years before the end of the war, Churchill was after the plan for running Germany. And we didn't have a plan for Iraq four hours before we crossed the Tigris River. And such plans as they were were simply thrown out by Rumsfeld. Why do we do this? Is it because 24-hour television on 24 is meaning, means that our leaders just plan for the next six or seven hours. Oh, we've captured Saddam Hussein. Can we hold the news for an hour? We'll get on prime time. All these spin doctors, they're not spin doctors, they're liars. You know, working on Blair, so he always has the right... The great Blair line is, I've got a tape in Beirut. When I'm really depressed, I play it for a good laugh. And it has Blair in Parliament. He's saying, I absolutely and completely believe I am right. <laughs> I mean, absolutely and completely is not enough, you know. But... I think, to a considerable degree, that politicians have been corrupted by the television's needs. And television corrupted by politicians as well. You know, I've, I've expressed this before in Ottawa, so if you see me do this little mimicking act, you'll forgive me, but you only have to watch a presidential press conference on, uh, on the CNN. I don't recommend it. And, you know, you see the journalist say, Mr. President, Mr. President! <laughs> you know, yes, Bob. Yes, John. Yes, Sheila. You see, that's the relationship. It's osmotic, parasitic. Highly dangerous. Um, and I don't know how you deal with this. I mean, I suppose the other issue is that, you know, there isn't a single Western leader today who's ever been in a war. Their experience of the war, the policy option, is Hollywood. And when I grew up, you know, British Prime Ministers, Attlee, Churchill, Eden, they've been in the First War. In the Second War, Churchill had even been at the Battle of Omdurman. William Whitelaw, first Secretary of State to Northern Ireland when I was in Belfast, had been at the crossing of the Rhine. They knew what war meant. But not one of our leaders knows. You know George Bush? He was defending the skies over Texas during the Vietnam War, wasn't he? <laughs> All those North Vietnamese aircraft were swarming around. And members of his administration had other things to do, like Mr. Cheney, who had a lot of business problems to attend to at the time of the Vietnam War. Colin Powell was the last US administration figure. Of course, he was in a war, and that was Vietnam. Um, and look what a fool he had to make of himself. I was actually in the UN um, Security Council when he made his fav famous speech you know, I, what I am saying is not just supposition, it is absolutely based on concrete facts. Behind him, George Tenet was sitting near the set. When you're a few meters away, you actually can see a lot more than you do on television. You're sitting there like James Cagney, you know. And there was a lovely scene at the beginning when Jack Straw, who was Foreign Secretary for our dear and beloved former Prime Minister, came in in this huge double-breasted power suit and sort of sniffed the air, and he saw Colin Powell and ran like this, around the Security Council desk for his big American hug. It was, you had to see these things too. To, to understand them. And then Colin Powell had this big screen comes up. Television, 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 you see. We believe that the Iraqi government has laboratories, mobile laboratories on railway trains. Now, anyone who's traveled on Iraqi state railways under sanctions will know that the train will come off the track. 
You know? <laughs> but the screen showed an artist's impression. I don't know if it's the State Department or the Pentagon. And sure enough, there was a, a side, you know, a cross section of a railway carriage with lots of um, sort of benches. And there was a man in a long white coat holding a test tube doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing. It's infantilism. Good for TV. It's babyishness. Fantasy. And it was a fantasy. Why did even members of the government go along with the fantasy? I actually do believe that Blair believed, or do I? I'm not sure. I think he did believe what he believed because he believed it. Belief is enough now. <laughs> yeah. Faith, here we go again. Um, poor old God. There's a lovely poem, isn't there, by Siegfried Sassoon, and he, he talks about the two sides in the First World War, you know, the Germans and the British in the trenches, and the Germans are praying to God in German, the British are saying, God help us, and God's up in heaven saying, God this, God that. My God said God, I've got my work cut out, you know. And I often think it applies to Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, and so on. Um, look, I go back now and look at a man, Winston Churchill. He's not a hero of mine, Churchill. Uh, I did my PhD at Trinity College Dublin in Irish neutrality in the um, Second World War, and uh, Churchill was spending an awful lot of time planning to reinvade Ireland, you know, having had the 1916 Rising and the 1920 War of Independence. He wanted to go back again. He wanted the three major treaty ports for the Royal Navy in the Battle of the Atlantic. But I went back in time through my files of Winston Churchill. I'll tell you a little story about how I got them. I used to work in a dark and secret part of my past, which I don't talk about, for the Sunday Express in London. And I ran the diary column for a while, where I chased vicars and bishops who'd run off with starlets. It's very good practice for the Middle East, as you can probably imagine. And one day I went down to the library. It was a cuttings library, big wooden drawers and every cutting. Every newspaper in Britain had been filed since the 1418 war. And they were throwing out every clipping of every newspaper from 1929 to 1945 because they were going to do this system, I think it was called microfiche, a hopeless system, it didn't work. And then they threw all the clippings away so they couldn't restart the system again. And I realised that microfiching was a mess because you sit there going through this old system, I don't think you even use it now, of running a, a, a film through a projector and trying to spot the bit of newspaper you want to see. So every night I would load up my car with boxes and boxes of the Sunday Express wartime library, nick the whole lot and take it home. And I've still got the lot in my garage in Ireland, the whole lot. <laughs> and so when I have to deal with things like Churchill or I'm going back to the Arab world in World War II, I go to these files unprecedented. No one else has got them. Even Martin Gilbert, who's the official historian for Winston Churchill, hadn't seen all that Churchill had written in the papers in the 1930s, because Churchill had invested in shares in Wall Street. It sounds faintly familiar, doesn't it? Not subprime loans, but basically the same thing. And Wall Street crashed, and Churchill was very poor. So he wrote for the newspapers. And he wrote one wonderful piece. <laughs> Just wait till you get this. This is Churchill. He went on holiday to Morocco in 1936. The Daily uh, Express paid for his holiday. And, of course, this was French Morocco, and he was amazed by the new roads, telephones, electricity, and so on. And then he wrote a, an article about his trip there for the Daily Express. I'm going to read you the last three paragraphs. The Arab inhabitants are a perpetual attraction with their flowing, many-coloured robes. Every peasant is a picture, every crowd a pageant. He's in travel agent mode. If winter sunshine is the quest, here is its achievement. Thus far all smiles. Is there a darker underside? The Arabs are a proud and ancient race, till only yesterday a race of conquerors. Are they tamed? Are they rec reconciled to this new civilization with its order, its efficiency, its many benefits, its proofs of active progress and its sense of effort? Here's our US Marine Colonel in Ramadi. Or are they dreaming of the days of Arab greatness? The faith of Islam holds them all in a discipline of its own. From the balcony of my up-to-date hotel, I heard all night long the chants and drumbeats of the mosques, an endless repetition of choruses in which war and religion have an equal part. Who shall plumb the future? My God, he did. This is a sort of clipping when I, I find it, I put ouch at the end of it, exclamation mark. It's quite a lot around from Churchill, actually. He really did begin to get it right long before anyone else did. So did Lawrence of Arabia. I've got a 19, from the same files, I've got his 1929 entry for the Encyclopedia Britannica under the title Gorilla. Apparently, American officers are now reading this, but they're just a little bit late. If they'd read it before 2003, like God's advice to Tony, it might have been more use. <laughs> Writing of Arab resistance to Turkish occupation, which of course he was leading the Arab resistance, in the 1914-18 war, he asks of the insurgents, some of whom he led, 
Suppose they were an influence, a thing invulnerable, intangible, without front or back, drifting about like a gas. Armies are like plants, immobile as a whole, firm-rooted, nourished through long stems to the head. The Arabs might be a vapour. He was playing, of course, on the horror of gas warfare in the First World War when he wrote this. He goes on, he said, to control the land they occupied, the Turks needed a fortified post every four square miles in Iraq, and a post could not be less than 20 men. The Turks would need 600,000 men to meet the combined ill will of the local Arab people. Americans got 300,000, with perhaps 300,000 mercenaries, but that's another story. Accurately predicting Al-Qaeda's modern-day use of the internet, Lawrence wrote that the printing press is the greatest weapon in the armory of the modern guerrilla commander. For insurgents, battles were a mistake. Napoleon had spoken in angry reaction against the excessive finesse of the 18th century when mo most men almost forgot that war gave license to murder. And Lawrence, realizing in his canny way he was right, continued with these frightening predictions. Rebellion must have an unassailable base in the minds of men converted to its creed. It must have a sophisticated alien enemy in the form of a disciplined army of occupation too small to fulfill the doctrine of acreage, too few to adjust number to space in order to dominate the area effectively from fortified posts. The insurgency must have a friendly population, not actively friendly, but sympathetic to the point of not betraying rebel movements to the enemy. Rebellions can be made by 2% active in a striking force and 98% passive. Granted mobility, security, time and doctrine, victory will rest with the insurgents, for the algebraical factors are in the end decisive, and against them, perfections of means and spirit struggle quite in vain. Why didn't we read that before 2003? That's Afghanistan today. That's exactly it. The gas and the vapours drift through the villages of Helmand, and we end up defending faraway villages whose names we can't pronounce. Remember how a lovely American travel writer once said that the Bosnian War was the unpronounceables shooting at the unspellables. And it sometimes <laughs> feels the same. I can actually write it in Arabic, of course. But that's the story of Afghanistan, written in 1929 by one of the experts before he killed himself in his motorbike. I want to end by going back to Gaza again. The phone call came at around 4.20 p.m. on Saturday. A bomb had been dropped on our house at our small farm in northern Gaza. <coughs> My father was walking from the gate to the farmhouse at the time. It was our beloved place, that farm and its two-storey white house with a red roof. Nestled in a flat, fertile agricultural plain northwest of Beit Lahia in Gaza, it had lemon groves, orange and apricot trees, and we'd recently acquired 60 dairy cows. His father, by the way, was a judge with the Palestinian Authority, an educated man who spoke fluent English. It was the closest farm to the northern border with Israel. Ironically, we always thought the biggest danger there was not from Israeli troops, who usually went straight past if they were mounting an incursion, but from a stray Hamas rocket aimed at the Israeli towns north of us. But shortly before sunset on Saturday, as Israeli ground troops and tanks invaded Gaza in the name of shutting down Hamas rocket sites, the peace of that place was shattered and my father's life extinguished at the age of 48. Warplanes and helicopters had swept in, bombing and firing, to open up the space for the tanks and ground forces that would follow in the darkness. It was one of those F-16 airstrikes that killed my father. The house was reduced to little more than powder, and of Dad there was nothing much left. Just a pile of flesh, my uncle, who found him in the rubble, said later with brutal honesty. My grief carries no desire for revenge, which I know to be always in vain. But in truth, as a grieving son, I am finding it hard to distinguish between what the Israelis call terrorists and the Israeli pilots and tank crews who are invading Gaza. What is the difference between the pilot who blew my father to pieces and the militant who fires a small rocket? I have no answers. My wife is pregnant, but just as I am again about to become a father, I have lost my father. Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Now, now comes your time to attack me or ask a question if you want. There's always a glorious moment when no one puts their hand up and I think I can sneak out like a hiatus snake, you know. Uh, but the one thing I'm always happy about in Canada is this is the only country where I don't get 
the question I get from somebody in Cork in Ireland who kicked over chairs when I refused to answer it. And I got it in, in Yerevan in Armenia. I've had it in Melbourne and Sydney in Australia. I've had it in Auckland. I certainly get it in Britain. And it is this question. Mr. Fisk, why don't you admit you know George Bush did 9-11? Somewhere in my archives, I've got the proof, you see. And I always say to the same speaker, it's the only way to close it down, George Bush screwed up everything he did in the Middle East. Do you really think he could do 9-11? <laughs> so, in the hope that you don't want to ask that question, shout away if you want. Um, if you can manage to make your voice heard by speaking up in here, because we don't have any spare mics, if you can't, I'll run up and give you my mic to speak through. Gentlemen, right at the back. But, Shout it out and don't make it too long because you'll run out of voice. I just want to say, I don't think we can emphasize enough this thing about the media. Because if the United States, the so-called superpower, is running the show in the Middle East, as it has done, um, they can't do it without the sanctioning of the public. And Canada is... Well, yes, they can. <laughs> well, but I'm saying that the media is so... Um, it has such power in indoctrinating them that... In Canada, the Canadian media and government is basically, as always, maybe it's because of our trade connections, but I think it's deeper than that. There's a, there's a, a great alliance between, you know, in our North American continent. So, uh, what I'm basically trying to say is, if the media could be unbiased somehow, so that's the trick, as, so as to inform 99% of the public, because it, it seems at least 99% of the public in North America are clueless. At best, we think it's both sides in the Middle East equation, Palestinian and Israeli. And the question is, the question is um, I just, what do you think about the idea of, like, I was, I've been thinking, how do you get this, uncover this thing to the, the masses? And I think uh, for, uh, prominent speakers who seem to know what is what, who are respected, uh, basically, across the board, if they could get together, write a book, do, co do a conference, make some kind of splash, the average person or the average uh, group that does demonstrations have okay. been doing okay. this for years. Yeah. Uh, Can you all hear what he said or do you want me to repeat it? Okay, basically uh, the question was that, you know, governments and the press tend to work together. How can people mobilize, he didn't use that word, but I think that's what he meant, in such a way that you could get the truth of the reality out to 99% of the people whom he described in North America as clueless, and he referred to them as the masses, and was there a way of doing this by publishing a book by lots of people who know the situation on the ground? Um, I'm going to take issue with this. Uh, I lecture a lot in America, usually every three and a half weeks, I mean the United States. And I think the Americans are very smart. And I'm not just talking to you know, Marines or university students. I, at UCLA, I get 2,000 people sometimes, and they're not all students. And I think they know exactly what's going on. I don't think there's a problem in learning. You know, they, there's lots of ways of doing it. Remember, America is coast-to-coast -coast universities with departments of Islamic studies, departments of Middle Eastern studies, departments of Hebrew studies. There's a huge fully treasured brain out there. The fact that the US government doesn't want to listen to it or hear it or deal with it doesn't matter. Um, and I think there are plenty of books. I mean, you, you know, Naomi Klein's books and uh, Noam Chomsky's books. We're obviously choosing the usual suspect here. There's even Robert Fisk's books. Occasionally he slipped in as an advertisement. Um, you could read The Independent, by the way, you know, if I may say so. I know that's not what you mean, but there are papers. The Guardian. Up to a point, that, uh, I know, I know, and up to a point, the Financial Times. Uh, certainly Le Monde, not Le Figaro, because it's owned by Dassault, the great arms company. You won't find any investigations into the arms business in Le Figaro. Uh, certainly Liberation, until it goes broke, which I'm afraid it will very soon. Um, you know, there are ways to find out information if you don't have it. But I, I don't know. I had a discussion yesterday uh, in French with students in the University of Montreal. Uh, who were in media studies and producing a student newspaper. And they were all asking me a similar sort of question. And I said, you need to find a philanthropist with millions of dollars who will back you. I have to say, my paper is losing a huge amount of money. We've just laid off, what, 70 of our staff. Uh, and mainly because people are reading us free on the internet, you see. And which is a serious problem, because it means that when I need to go to Egypt, my budget won't cover it, so I can't travel. So you don't get Robert in Egypt, because you're not paying for the independent. A lot of people aren't. That's a major problem for all newspapers now, and including, of course, in Canada and the United States. Um, but it needs a real newspaper set up, if, that, you know, if you want an international version of it, with money behind it. Uh, blogs don't work. 
There's no money in the internet for people who want to be reporters. It doesn't work. Uh, I know guys who turned up in Baghdad in very dangerous circumstances to write their blogs. They wrote very well and they went broke. Uh, you, you know, running a foreign correspondent takes a lot of money. It takes many, many thousands of dollars a month to keep my operation operating out of Beirut and covering what almost 22 countries sometimes. It takes a lot of money to cover for our Jerusalem correspondent, my, my friend Don McIntyre, who's in Jerusalem and colleague. Um, I think what it needs is a new... A, you, you can't reform old newspapers. It's like corruption in countries where it's too deep. You know, you, how do you deal with corruption in Pakistan? I keep asking people. It's in every institution, from the boot black boy to the policeman to the president. I don't know what you do. But I don't think you can sort of reform the National Post, reform the Globe and Mail, turn it into what it is not. Certainly not if it's edited from Winnipeg, that's for sure. But the main, the main thing is to, if you want to do what you are doing, is see if, not if there's a great number of people who know the Middle East, but are there a great number of people with money who want to invest in something which is morally great? And then you get your reporters, and then you get a paper that people will buy because they support it and believe in it and want to learn the truth. Um, I'd have to say that readers are fickle people. Many years ago now, the Times in London, under my friend Mr. Murdoch, uh, cut its price by half, of course, subsidizing the Times with the vast, well, what was then the vast treasury of Murdoch's other institutions around the world. And the idea was to try and cut down our circulation, which was way above a quarter of a million. And of course, we independent writers, we said, our readers know the value of the independent. They are loyal to us. And then thousands left for the Times because it was cheaper. That's a problem you need to keep in mind. Uh, and at these times of economic crisis, people are giving up newspapers as one of the first things they sacrifice to save money. And anyway, they can read it on the net, and that is a major problem. Sorry, that's a big answer to a smaller question. <laughs> Gentlemen here, if you can really shout up, but I can repeat what you say if you keep it short, and I'll remember what you say. Yep, thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to ask you what to do, but I, I won't ask that no, question. I'll ask a different one. Um, You've certainly noticed how Canada's policies have changed yes. in Palestine over the last three or four years. Uh, just let me, he's saying, I've surely noticed how Canada's policies have changed over the last three or four years. Someone may explain why you're in Afghanistan at some point, because I've forgotten. Yes, carry on. Certainly the Israeli press has noticed Canada's policies have yes, changed. Can you tell us whether the rest of the world has noticed whether Canada's policies have changed? Okay, certainly the Israelis have noticed that Canada's policies have changed. Has the rest of the world noticed? Um, Look, I, I'm, you're not going to like my reply. I can only tell you about the Middle East because that's where I work. The rest of the time I'm on airplanes and talking to folk in lovely places. But I, I read you know, the press in the United States and Canada and all over the place in Brazil and France and Belgium and so on. Um, you know, there's no doubt that Canada was known as a peacekeeping country, as Ireland is still known, even though it's joined the partnership for peace with NATO without the referendum that the government promised. It's a neutral country, of course. I remember my greatest memory of Canadian troops was in Bosnia. Um, not Lewis Mackenzie, though I met him later in Serbia. Um, and I was with an officer in, uh, on the Bosnian Croat border. We were getting pasted with shells by the Serbs. And we all, one of the press officers, huddled in ditches. We were all huddling in ditches. And the shells were banging down. They were trying to kill us. And I, I said this, I had this major next to me, and I said, what do you think the UN is worth, you know, putting on blue helmets, right? And he said, look, Robert, he said, if there'd been a United Nations in 1914, there might not have been a battle of the Somme. Very impressive. Because Canadians thought about peacekeeping, about peace, about switching the guns off, you see. And I think that people haven't realized you're not peacekeepers anymore. There are still a few Canadians on the true supervisory a group, UNSO, on the Lebanese-Israeli border. This is not UNIFIL, this is UNSO. We've been there since 48. So they still see Canadians with a maple leaf and a blueberry and not they have no weapons in UNSO. But Afghanistan has obviously changed. You are now fighting Islamists. You're now fighting in the Muslim world. That, and you are seen as a crusader in Afghanistan. They know about Canada there. And believe me, the, the, the Al-Qaeda understand what Canada's doing. And they've talked about it, they've mentioned it. If you mean ordinary people, I think you know they've been so battered around by the Americans and the Brits and the West in general, and the French, and the, we've got German warships off the coast of Lebanon now, looking for weapons that, of course, are coming across the Syrian border, which is not in the sea, it's in dry land. Um, I don't think most people have noticed. You could probably scramble out with your reputation intact, but I don't know if you can carry on. One of the amazing things when you're reporting wars on and on and on is that even as a reporter who was there at the beginning, 
you find you forget how it started. You know, what was the motive? You know, we all say the NATO war in Serbia was thought to get the Kosovo Albanians back into their homes. But they were all in their homes when the war started. You see, we picked up this little mission creep on the way. Even mission creep is a cliche. How did we get involved in Afghanistan? I mean, it was, many people tell me it was Harper. It wasn't Harper. It was before Harper that your, your soldiers started going out to Afghanistan. And it was always it was going to be military security to give support for the reconstruction of the country. How can a guy firing a machine gun in a village in Helmand build a bridge? You can't do it. You know, one of the problems is, after the Second World War, the Marshall Plan worked. The Russians refused it, so it didn't work in Eastern Europe. But the Marshall Plan was not to send millions of Americans to Europe to rebuild bridges and factories and railroads. The French and the Germans knew how to build bridges and railroads. It was money they needed, properly administered through proper administrations. But we want to send soldiers there too. And the administrations that we have set up are corrupt. And that is the problem. And, you know... I've met Canadian soldiers who can't remember why, why the campaign started. I can't even remember. Sometimes I can, actually. But you know, when I'm not thinking about it, when did that happen? You know, and the, it's amazing when you find the troops actually there can't remember how the war began. This is truly Orwellian, in the, in the, not the cliché sense, but the genuine sense. Um, but Middle East, I don't think they're noticing it. You don't have a huge contingent in Afghanistan, quite big enough for you. Um, and you know, going back to the press thing, I was very struck not long ago when the first woman Canadian soldier was killed. And I was on the plane which carried her body to Ottawa uh, with her family who were in business class at the front of it. Everyone was smiling at them and being very kind. And of course, no one wanted to raise the issue because they were obviously weighed down by their grief. And a couple of days later, I opened the Globe and Mail, of course. And there was a very moving picture of the family whom I'd been sitting beside at the graveside in the Ottawa Cemetery. And it was on page six. Now, I know you've lost more than 100 soldiers, but every one of your dead soldiers should be on page one. You do not see the war. You don't even see the dead. You don't even put the flag to half-mast now in Ottawa. What the hell is going on, you know? I mean, I know there's the highway of heroes. I've read about it. I've actually driven down it and seen it. But, you know, why was it on page six? This picture should have been on page one. This is your history. So the, the press go along and connive it. They make fun of Harper and they make fun of Ignatiev, quite rightly so in both cases. But the problem is that um, the reality is not getting across still. Um, and one of the things, I'm going to go completely off the point, but it's something I perhaps should have said earlier on. We all go off the point, that's how the New York Times runs. And um, is that we still think that we can have foreign adventures without paying the price. After the Second World War, we got used to sending our soldiers abroad. Sure, they came back dead. In many cases, of course, they were buried on the scene of the battlefield. I mean, it spent a lot of money, dropped a lot of bombs, but we were safe at home. No North Korean ever blew himself up on the London tube. No North Vietnamese or Viet Cong ever blew themselves up in Washington. The IRA set off a few bombs in London, but not very seriously. Kenyans, Mau Mau didn't come to Britain and blow themselves up. Irgun didn't. But that has all changed now. We are not safe anywhere, whether in Montreal or Dublin or London or Nevada, or anywhere. And we don't realize that. We don't realize because we're constantly told by our presidents, our, this has got nothing to do with the Middle East. Nothing at all. These are just people who hate our way of life. They just happen to be Muslims. You know? I mean, it's like on 9-11. I was crossing the Atlantic. My plane turned around, of course, and came back. And I was on a radio show that night with a US academic who was particularly abusive, who will not be named. Yes, of course it was, with Alan Dershowitz. And, <laughs> and the moment I asked why, we all knew how, you know, um, um, uh, box cutters, aeroplanes, tall buildings, and we all know who, you know, 19 Arabs, but the moment you ask why, you've got a problem. You look for the motive of the great international crime against humanity, and Alan Dershowitz said I was an anti-Semite for asking it. God knows what that meant. He said I was a Nazi, basically. For asking why, because if you ask why, you, you, you know, if a policeman on the streets, well, you don't have any crime in Ottawa, but the streets on <laughs> Vancouver, um, <laughs> the, the first thing the police do when they find a crime is look for a motive. But after 9-11, we weren't supposed to look for a motive, were we? Like, hmm, 19 Arabs, that means they come from the Middle East. Is there a problem out there? No? Um, the press is not controlled, it doesn't have to be. I'm afraid it's the journalists. Um, I know in North America you have to have equality. I'm looking for any lady who's got this one. 
Now, can you shout or shall I come up and lend you my mic? Or? No, no, even though I'm a woman, I can shout. Actually, she can. She's better than the men tonight. Go ahead. You have influenced me more than any person uh, that I have ever read. You are a lady of judgment and sensitivity. <laughs> But I'm very depressed, and you haven't convinced me with respect to Obama. And I, I want you to try to convince me, because I, I fear that because you, you are a man who questions authority, because you're a man who suspects anyone who has power, I hope to God that you're wrong, and that you're coming to a conclusion too quickly. I hope so too. He has inspired millions of people, and my impression at least, as a great cynic, and someone who knows politicians very, very well, is that he is different. Now, what is it that makes you so sure that he's not going to make a difference in the Middle East? Because I think he can, if he chooses to, and you seem so convinced that you've got me troubled and, and, and um, depressed. He's going to be a one-term president if he wants to make a difference in the Middle East. I'm sorry to say. And I don't think he wants to be a one-term president. Um, you know, I was very struck at the time of Gaza. He was silent. Not at Mumbai, where he spoke out against the terrorist <laughs> atrocities. But on Gaza, he was silent. Why? That's the problem. I, I hope you're right. I don't think you are. Um, you know, one of the problems I have is that I have nothing but a pessimistic message for you. I haven't any hope in the Middle East at the moment, none at all. But I do think that until you realize there is no hope, you won't find a way forward. As long as you keep feeding on hopes, on this, this progress, what was, the, what was the phrase again? <laughs> and seeing if we can build on some of the progress, at least in conversation that's been made around the Israeli palace, around it. I don't think this is powerful stuff from a great, new, inspiring man. Yes, he's inspiring for all the reasons we know. I was in America during the election. I was doing Al Jazeera International as well as the Independent. I was always looking at the Middle East side, the Middle East side. I was not impressed. He sent poor old George off to the Middle East, the, peace, the peacemaker of uh, George Mitchell, the peacemaker of, of Northern Ireland. Um, but the guy is 75. He can't deal with the Netanyahu's of this world. I know George Mitchell. I had lunch with him in Belfast just over a year ago. He's a very nice guy, very honorable man. But you know, the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland doesn't travel. You know, peace agreements don't travel. You can't oh, we'll have that one, please, and have a couple of those, put in the sandwich and send it off to Vietnam or wherever. It doesn't work. Um, you know, John Hume, who's the only living statesman in Ireland today, whom I know very well, he wrote a big article in the Jerusalem Post in 2000, suggesting that he'd like to, you know, put the Good Friday Agreement on a plane and send it off to you know, Ramallah and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Uh, that, you know, it was all about compromise. <laughs> the same old line. Um, and I said to him, I saw him in Derry, you know, which is where he lives, or London Derry, as the Brits call it. Um, and I said, John, you're wrong. It doesn't work. I said, the nearest parallel to the Middle East and Ireland is Cromwell's dispossession of the Catholics in the 17th century. And I don't think Cromwell was looking for a middleman or a, what's the French, an interlocutor valable, you know. Um, I, 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 I sniff around for hope everywhere. I had a little bit when I realized how many young Lebanese had returned to Lebanon when the war was more or less over and stayed on in Lebanon even after the murder of former Prime Minister Rafi Hariri on February 14, 2005. But many of them have started to leave. I know them. They're going back to where they were educated. You know, America, Geneva, London, Paris, wherever. Um, and when you see not just the corruption but the absolute dictatorships across the Middle East, our dictatorships, of course, because we're paying them and arming them and training their vicious police forces. Um, I don't see much hope. The only hope I can see anywhere at all is if Mohammed Hatami won the presidential election in Iran. Because I wrote a piece oh, more than a year ago in which I was saying, what happened to the Titans? Where are the Roosevelts and the Churchills and the Titos? And the only man I could think of with any integrity in the whole Middle Eastern region was Hatami. I have to admit, I know him. I, I gave a lecture alongside him in Chicago two years ago a very fine, honorable man who tried to bring a civil life to Iran and asked the world to help share it. And we slapped him down. We didn't want him. So we got Ahmadinejad, and he's a crackpot. Congratulations, to me. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Bush. I hope you're right. I fear you're wrong. Right. Um, this lady here, but you're going to have to shout like this lady over here. Oh, I can shout. OK, I'm sure. God, the feminism in this room is so heavy. <laughs> 
I have great hope that with the world going into a, a, a big depression, let's face it, it's a depression we're going into, that there will be less money for America to give to the Israelis to keep up the violence. So I think it may... <laughs> Fear not. They'll have some time. <laughs> Look, I'll tell you something. Not many months ago, senior US officers went on a semi-secret trip to Tel Aviv, which is where the Israeli Ministry of Defense is, it's not in Jerusalem, to tell the Israelis directly, because of course the Bush administration wouldn't, if you go for Iran, you're on your own. The American military does not have the technical or manpower capacity for any more wars. It's got two and it's enough. Unfortunately, however, as we all know, if Iran does get attacked by Israel, Iran will fire at US forces in, naval forces in the Gulf and on the ground in Afghanistan, I'm sure, and certainly in Iraq. Uh, what will Netanyahu do? Who even now is warning of the dangers of, and the necessity, possible necessity of attacking Iran. I don't know. I mean, interesting days ahead. Keeps me in work, doesn't it? But I wish it didn't. Um, I, don't, I think that's the last money spout that will be switched off. I really do. Uh, I, I do think that Obama is kicking off on a bad wicket, as we'd say in England, mixed metaphors. He's, he's got the economic crisis, which is more important in the United States than anything else in the world. And uh, can you really concentrate on that and then take your eye off the ball and have a look at Israel? Oh, God, send George back again. Huh? Let Hillary take care of it, you know? Uh, and Hillary will not take care of it, of course. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, Gentleman there with a sort of grey, white, black jacket. The, the great thing is tonight I've got the right glasses on. I, I was in Houston and saying, yes, the gentleman over there and this very indignant lady would stand up, you know. <laughs> anyway, can you shout out your question like the lady just did? I, I will try. Uh, okay. My question is about money, about uh, institutions, and about good journalism. Can I have some of this money? Yep. <laughs> The question is about money, institutions, and good journalism. So I'm repeating in case I can't hear. Journalists uh, need to make a life. And they create institutions when they work. And then we have governments, and we have a system that is capitalism, that if you don't make money, you cannot live. And then we have all this horrific situation in the world that is spreading around, and this conflict in the Middle East. What do you see in the future under these circumstances? What is the, the next wave of good journalism going to happen? Because I, I, I frankly, I, I, I believe that we are living in a hypocrisy today. I watch CNN, but I don't believe what CNN no, is telling no, And it's, it's like, like playing games, right? And I yeah. have my Facebook, and I cannot say my, yeah, my point yeah. of view because I am attacked by my friends yeah. in the network. So what is your view for the future? Okay, um, basically, he believes that journalism makes itself into a kind of institution. That capitalism is a system where if you don't make money, you fail. Um, what can we do with good journalism? How do we make it operate? I kind of answered that up there when I said, you know, you need to find a few philanthropists and run a proper newspaper. Um, but I don't think just journalism is the thing. I think that personal experience makes real politics. That's why I tell people to go to the Middle East and have a look with their own eyes. Do a little bit of research, throw the internet out, put the screen away, a whole library of good books. You don't have to read The Independent. An air ticket, you know, get a good price. Go to Jordan, go talk to the people in the Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Don't go to Sidon, go to Beirut camps or Tripoli. See how they're living. See what they say. Because they're the people who are suffering. We're suffering, I know, you know, there's not enough money and, and you know, we, we can't buy all the things we want or pay off the mortgage and we may lose our homes. Uh, an awful lot of people will. I don't think I will, but, I, you know, we never know these days. But I think if you go out and see the destitution of people who are living in the Middle East, all those who suffer there, and I don't recommend countries which are very dangerous, I think if enough people went there and even perhaps tried to work there directly to help them rather than our Blairs and Bushes and you know, Browns and so on, and, and even our Obamas, I think they might make a little bit of difference. You know, one of the things we don't realize about the Middle East is that after World War II, we kind of closed the door on history. We had the UN, the General Assembly, we had the Security Council, we had the protocols of the um, Geneva Conventions, the International Red Cross, the European Union, a whole system of barriers set up to protect our human rights and our freedoms. They're getting whittled away thanks to the late or the former Mr. Bush, but we did. The Bush administration crashed many of them. We were back to rendition, torture, human rights abuses, etc. But the people in the Middle East never closed the door. Uh, 
uh, my friend uh, Mohammed Abu Rudaina, who's a refugee in um, Sabra, and actually in his Shatila camp, he keeps ringing me up on my mobile saying, Robert, it's Mohammed. <laughs> you remember? And I think, starting with the Prophet, there's about six million you know, in the immediate area. <laughs> But he gets up in shit every morning, in dirt and filth. And with his sister, they're the only surviving members of the family. All the rest were butchered. Um, his sister was eviscerated when she was pregnant by the phalange in the massacre of 82. They get up and they have to sweep dirt off the stairs. I took a friend of mine, an Irish friend of mine, he's a builder, you know, quite a well-off guy. He, he wanted to come to Lebanon on a holiday. Crazy guy, he loved the holiday to go there. And I took him to Shatila and he said, these houses are terribly built. Look at the cracks up there and those bricks. Yeah. <laughs> There's a story, you better hang around for a while, you'll get it, right? This guy is still living the Balfour Declaration. It happened last week, last night, this morning when he got up. He lives it now. They are living this history today. We've forgotten about it. We keep saying, oh, can't we turn over the page? Let's have a clean break. Let's start again. You Palestinians, I know you've had a rather hard time. Things haven't been easy since 67 or 48. It doesn't work like that. These people suffer continually now. And we said, what's that great phrase that came out from, uh, I can't remember who it was, is it, why do they hate us? Go to Sabra and Shatila and talk to people there. They don't hate us, actually, but they are white hoss incendiary with frustration that they will not get the one thing that all Arabs and all Muslims ask when I ask them, what do you want? They do not ask for democracy. They do not ask for human rights, though they'd like some of it. They ask for justice. And that we do not intend to give them. Uh, it's got to be the lady in red. Um, if you can pitch your voice up, and I'll repeat the question if other people don't get it. I'll take about three more questions, and then, having had 12 hours of Quebecois yesterday, you'll let me go off to my hotel to take the phone calls that might be coming after Christian's radio program. <laughs> Carry on. Um, I'm just a little confused in terms of me trying to understand what's happening. So if I understood you correctly, you're saying the major problem is how the West is heavily involved in supporting the really bad institutions in the Middle East that continues this process of I guess unfairness and injustice. So what I'd like to know is kind of like two questions is, can, like are the, the Arab world and the Muslims, do they have any responsibility themselves oh, right. to change that? That's one. And two, because like right now, ever since I guess the world war is like, anytime they're trying to respond back to, I guess the Western meddling into their affairs, they're going more like hardcore religious fanatical, and this is like a danger to the West in itself, so is the West not concerned in general about their own safety? So I'm just trying to understand, like, is it all about money or is it I, I'll, I'm now going to do a pricey of your question, because I don't think everybody, you didn't all hear her, did you? No, some didn't. Okay, basically, it's do the Arab governments or the Arabs not have some responsibility for what's going on, even though we obviously are propping up the dictators, etc. And is there anything we can do about countries where it gets more and more? I think you said you know hardcore extremist or whatever, or fundamental. Like you know, Taliban, Saudi Arabia, yeah, you know, sure. Persia, well, like the, the I, I'll, I'll start by saying one of the differences we don't spot at the moment, because again, we're not really talking about it or told about it, is that when I first went to the Middle East 33 years ago, almost 33 years ago. Every enemy of the West, and here I'll make Israel an honorary member of the West, was nationalist, socialist, pro-Soviet, Soviet-backed. It was the DFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command, the po Palestine Liberation Organization, the, the FLN, etc., etc. Every enemy of the West in the Muslim world today, and here again I'm letting Israel have honorary membership of the West, is Islamist, Hamas. Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, the, the, the GIA in Algeria, uh, the Taliban. They're all Islamist, and we still don't realize that. We still think it's the old Middle East. The problem, I think, with your Arab regimes is they can't do anything. You know, Mubarak, who's 80, he needs us, and we need him. Are we going to rock the boat? Because he keeps up. Do you want those Muslim fundamentalists in power? Remember what democracy did in Palestine? Ah. Do you, know, you think the Egyptian? No, I know the Egyptian people. Right? That's why we call him La Vache Curie in Egypt. <laughs> and it's true. And soon it'll be a caliphate if Gamal takes over. It's already a caliphate in Syria because Bashar took over from Hafez. 
And all these, I mean, the Syrians depend on us too. We're very happy to help them. Though I noticed the governor of the central bank in Damascus made a very grim and a pessimistic prognostication of the future economic possibilities of Syria a few weeks, uh, two weeks ago. But no, I don't see how you break out of it. King Abdullah of Jordan is not going to introduce democracy. Uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, <laughs> I've got a Saudi file at home. It's a drawer that I pull out and it comes all the way out to here. And it's packed with clippings and cuttings. And every two years I go back, it's Saudis announce reforms. <laughs> Beginnings of democracy in Saudi Arabia, question mark. Women can't drive, of course, and they're chopping off heads. But there's a and then two years later, the king, whichever one it was at the time, feels that reform didn't really take root in the way he planned. But now there are real plans for reforms, and it still goes on. Journalists are actually flown out to meet various um, operable princes, as I call them, <laughs> who say the right things, and usually with a Harvard or a... A Columbia accent and <laughs> the newspaper men come back and they write about more reforms in Saudi Arabia um, these people will not reform and we do not wish them to and our response unfortunately to Islamism what does Parry Match call it the food de dieu the madman of God for heaven's sakes is not to say hang on a second we better deal with this problem but it's to say okay send them some more riot gear they need more tear gas they need more weapons the police of course Train the police force. We don't want human rights abuses, and there's none that we see, you know. Forget the Lazugli Street secret police headquarters in central Cairo at this point. I think we continue, and we will continue to do this and give them weapons and money because we'll do anything rather than face what we faced in Algeria. Another election where those pesky Algerians didn't want le pouvoir anymore. They wanted to vote for the fils, and we all know what happened then. And even the army joined in in the massacres. If you've read that wonderful book, La Salle Guerre, in French, uh, published by Descuvert in Paris, the truth about the Algerian army's involvement in the massacres, which the Islamists were also committing. Um, you know, I don't know how you get out of this system. We, you know, we used to run the Middle East. We used to occupy it. Now we get the people there to occupy it for us. And you know, poor old Egyptians. Every year we're told they're going to rise up and the Egyptian patience is exhausted. It never is exhausted. The police come down and bash them down again and put the politicians into prison. And it's the same old story. And you know, you, what is it? What is it? Al Haram once called me. I, I, I was complaining about fake elections in Egypt and it called me a black crow pecking at the corpse of Egypt. That's quite an honor from the Egyptian press, actually. Um, I, I don't really have any, you know, I can only say that to you in response to your question. I don't think. There's a way around it. This is, this is, a, this is a, a, a system that is meant to be continued eternally. Pretty much, yeah, that's what I... Sorry? Like, it's like a vicious cycle. They're creating the terror. It's not just a cycle, want, it's an eternal the wheel. <laughs> Who comes up in the, in the circle of fortune from time to time, I don't know, but it will go on turning, and it's meant to be there forever. We, are, we have no plans to introduce reforms to the Arab world. That, I say we, I'm talking about, you know, our esteemed uh, Mr. Blair, for example. <laughs> Sorry, I hate Blair. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd better move to someone else. This gentleman over here with the white beard, I would have a white beard if I had a beard. Yeah, you. <laughs> can you pitch your voice up and keep it fairly short so that I can remember to repeat the question to those people who can't hear you? I'll throw my voice. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Biscuit's uh, 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 brilliant, totally inspiring compliment. What's coming next might not be that, but you mentioned... You've got a Dublin accent, so of course. Oh, Mullingar. Oh, Mullingar. God damn it. I knew a man once in Mullingar who had a tin whistle and played it very well. I like the Midlands of Ireland. It's safe. <laughs> yes, that's right. I play one too. And I know you're, I know you're Irish for having been around this for decades. But one of the things you did mention, and, and, and you touched on at one particular point, you touched on again, and I just had it reiterated, is that there are great social movements in this country and in North America. We've had consistently uh, with Amnesty, the labour movement, with everybody, you can throw them up, we've seen, we, I, I recognise familiar faces, we are out there, we do make changes, and you saw the same in Britain, you saw the same on the streets, you saw the pressure in the Labour Party, so people are moving in our, in our country, in North America, and we are in, in Gaza, in the Middle East, and the war is a consistent Every year on the news, we are out there, we are working, we are making influences. You see it in the labor movement, you see it with Sid Ryan and the QB who took major steps. And yes, it was major steps. And, and, and you might add, you've had your martyrs like Rachel Corrie. 
And the most important thing about her death was the gutless refusal of the New York Theatre Company to show the play about her, because it advertised what happens when honest and decent Americans end up by being killed by the wrong people. But you don't have to be a martyr to do that. It's moving, and we are on the ground. Okay, well, let's do music here. Thank you so much. Cheering me up a bit tonight. <laughs> Very careful with Malingar people, I have to tell you that. You know. um, the lady right at the back, if I can hear you, with your hand up. Yes. It's, quite, um, yeah. I it's a little unfortunate that I have to say this because I was following what you were saying pretty closely and I agree with most of it. Um, just with the comment with regards to Khatami in Iran, mm -hmm. um, I think that you would, it'd be best to revisit that and I think relook at the situation because it would be just as bad to deal with the Pakistani government as it would be to deal with a, a puppet of the Iranian regime. And I think that it would be a good thing to look at his human rights record and look at the things that he's doing to his own people. Are you talking about Hatami? Hatami, yes. Okay. Yes. And I think it's within responsible journalism, I think that you need to take the responsibility to look at that situation further before saying that to this group. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, yeah. I, it's just the truth because as an Iranian, I can't let people... I thought you were Iranian, yes. <laughs> Did you all hear her question, by the way? That I should revisit my views on Hatami and his human rights record when he was running Iran. It was pretty grim, but I don't think he had a lot of leeway there. I mean, at the end of the day, he wanted to reach out to us, and we slapped him down, and we got Ahmadinejad, another, as I said, a victory for Bush. But I will. I'll go back through it again, promise you, and see if I haven't overestimated. I was looking for just one good man, as they say. <laughs> so there you go. I think it would also be responsible to look at other opposition movements within the country itself and at the end. Other, it would be responsible to look at other opposition movements inside the country itself. Outside the country as well. Can I ask you which one outside you're thinking about? Um, National Council of Resistance, for one. Yeah, um, that's what I feel. There's Mujahideen of Health. Okay, I've got, I, I, I understand uh, the message, I've got it. I'll take another look at my files. Yeah, okay. A lady here in blue, but you have to pitch. Oh, well, yes, sure, you can just tell me and I'll tell them what you're saying. Do you think uh, Israel will be bomb Iran? They will be Do I think Israel will bomb Iran? I haven't the slightest idea. I hate journalists who think they know things and talk about it that they don't. I don't know what Israel's going to do, and I doubt if Netanyahu will take a call from me. <laughs> and I doubt if he's going to tell me what he's going to do. I don't know is the answer, but if Netanyahu has Lieberman in the government, um, I won't be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. I, I have no idea what they're going to do. I really yeah, don't. Doctor, yeah. doctor. Um, gentlemen, right at the back with your hand up. Yes, that's it. Yep, yep. Uh, in relation to what you uh, answered the lady in red concerning... Uh, in relation to what you answered the lady in red concerning uh, dictatorship and the Arab world, mm -hmm. uh, don't you think Lebanon is a special, has a special situation? And I would like to know your opinion on the upcoming elections in Lebanon and how this will change the American influence, because... In my opinion, I think that's the first time that the uh, United States' influence and supremacy is actually challenged and might be overturned. You will have to know your opinion on that. <laughs> 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 always tell. Min wen be Lubnan. Min wen be Lubnan. Oh, uh, Sinefil Matuk. Okay, I, I've got it. You then work out like a computer, religion, background, education. <laughs> You always do the same thing every time I'm sitting next to someone in business class on Middle East Airlines. Min wen bil Beirut? Beirut, min wen bil Beirut? Ramnath al Baida, got him. <laughs> anyway, I got it, yes. Look, I think, I mean, I was talking to Saad Hariri, what, eight days ago, and I talked to most of the, you know, <laughs> what we would call the usual suspects. So I don't want to be too rude to him, he'd, he'd take it with a sense of humour. Um, I think there will be a centre block to prevent Hezbollah becoming part of the majority. I don't think there's much future left in the 14th people because, you know, Jim Blatt is going a slightly different way. Um, good old Jim Blatt. I always call him the greatest nihilist in the world. <laughs> and I called him that in a story and he sent me a biography of his father saying, from the greatest nihilist in the world. So <laughs> what can you say? Um, I think there'll be a centre block there. I think Lebanon is fascinating because it needs three PhDs to understand the voting system. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think proportional representation is bad in Israel. You want to try getting a vote in Lebanon and going down the list system. Good God. Um, I mean, the one good thing, I think, is that Aoun is going to get blocked. Um, and Aoun 
has a lot in common with Ahmadinejad, whom he's met. He's also a crackpot, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and a lot of people who supported him are beginning to realize that, which is why L'Oréal Le Jour is a much better newspaper, because it's almost 100% support for our own is beginning to go a little bit to one side, because they're wondering about men in white coats, if you see what I mean. Um, but le let me just finish. There's an overall problem with Lebanon. Yes, I, I don't think... Look, the Americans will use Lebanon like everyone else does, and like the Lebanon lets them. Uh, you know, I, I gave a, a lecture, uh, slightly shorter than this, but with a similar number of people in Nabatia, which is in the south of Lebanon. It's a Shiite area, it's mostly Amal, but there were quite a lot of Hezbollah people there, and I gave it to launch the Arabic edition of the Great War for Civilization. And at the end of it, a guy who actually was a Hezbollah guy said, Mr. Fisk, as an Englishman, what is the future of Lebanon? And I said, it has no future at all as long as you keep asking Englishmen what the future is. <laughs> I said, you want to ask... And this applies to Egyptians and Syrians and Jordanians and Palestinians. They want to know what Washington thinks, what New York thinks, what the UN thinks, what London thinks and Paris thinks and Tehran thinks and Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Please, you know, all you have to do is ask the people of Bradshit or Jibshit what they think or the people of Hermel or the people of Batroun, which is very close to the Meton. Then you'll learn that there is a future for Lebanon. There's no future if you keep wondering what foreigners think. But, you know, um, the problem with Lebanon is it is, of all countries, an artificial country, courtesy of our friend General Henri Gouraud and the first French mandate after the First World War. And if it's to be a modern state, Lebanon has to deconfessionalize. You know, the system that operates, as most of you will know now, where the president must be a Christian Maronite, the prime minister must be a Sunni Muslim, the uh, head of parliament has to be a Shiite, and so on and so forth. But the tragedy is that if you deconfessionalize Lebanon, it is no longer Lebanon, because the identity of Lebanon is sectarian. And that, I think, is the tragedy that Lebanese people live in. And I don't see the way out. I always say, I mean, I, I love living in Lebanon. I never say I love Lebanon. There's far too many foreigners say that. But I love living in Lebanon. But the trouble is, it's like having a magnificent Rolls Royce. The smell of fresh leather, everything is perfect. The food is magnificent. You can see the mountains out the window, but it's got square wheels. <laughs> That's the best I can answer your question. Uh, it'll carry on. Lebanon will last, believe me. Heaven knows how. There's a wonderful story of an Australian who was invited by the Chamber of Trade in Lebanon before the Civil War to explain the economy of Lebanon to the Chamber of Trade. And he spent two weeks talking to bankers, economists, businessmen, hotel owners, shareholders, came back to the Chamber of Trade after two weeks. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I haven't the slightest idea what you're doing, but keep it up. <laughs> Okay, I'll take two more questions and I'm going to fade away. Um, this gentleman's got to talk because he's got the finest head of white hair I've ever seen. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> Can you comment how the Middle East affect domestic policy in the West? How does the Middle East affect domestic policy in the West? The price of oil. That's all we care about. I'm sorry. That's all we care about, the price of oil. And, of course, if too many of our soldiers get killed teaching you democracy. I'm sorry to be so cynical. It's about oil. I don't think we care about you, and that's the problem. I think you probably care a lot about us, but you don't, we don't care about you. I'm sorry to be so frank with you, but that's the answer. His smile betrays his understanding. <laughs> <laughs> the lady over there in purple and with the scarf, yes, go ahead. Um, what should the West do with an oppressing regime such as the one in, with the Taliban in war? Like, for example, now in Darfur, Look, if we leave militarily the Middle East, we will lose our power over the regions, rulers, tribal chieftains, torturers and corrupt people. Um, and when the fact that we're not properly in Darfur shows the kind of thing that can happen. Um, I think, you know, the regimes that will come into being in the Middle East, if I, you know, if, if my wish to get the military out happened, will not be regimes that we would particularly like. Um, I don't think women's equality will take many, many steps backwards if that happens. The Taliban, there are Taliban who could be in government who were better than the previous Shah who were then before 2000 or up to 2001. Um, and in the end, though, we will talk to the Taliban. Believe me, we will talk to the Taliban. And we will encourage them into power. You know, we would never talk to the IRA, but we did. And now the IRA have tea with the Queen. And we will do the same with the Taliban. British forces are already talking to the Taliban. Americans started talking to the 
sort of satellite Al-Qaeda insurgency in Mosul at one point. Sergeants were saying, look, uh, if you stop mortaring the base, we'll um, cut down our patrols and kick out less doors, you know, and it was beginning. It was a little tiny negotiation. The British had a wonderful one in Kut al Amara. They had a deal going with the insurgents. If you let us do one trip down the main street a day from our base and don't shoot at us, we'll leave you do anything you want. <laughs> and I'm afraid that's how power works. I mean, we talked about that. I talked about that earlier. Um, I, I, you know, we, we want to have all this power when we go in there and feel people feel oppressed, but actually we don't control it. I mean, I didn't see any Westerners in Kandahar, this wonderful city which we are protecting from the Taliban, you see. Uh, this is part of the fantasy facade which comes up and down like that. And in a world where CNN and Fox News can actually have gold titles and theme music to every war we fight in, it does, like, you know, Ben-Hur or Spartacus or something, um, you know, do you expect anything else? Um, I haven't got an optimistic answer for you except to say that people will only learn how to govern properly by doing it on their own. They cannot have people from an alien world who are totally different in culture, educated, education, background, religion, if we have any religion left in, among the Christians of the West. You know. um, so I'm just going back to my old theme again. Maybe I'm getting a bit tired. One more question. Gentlemen there. Yeah. All right, on that note of self-governance and that people should govern themselves, and that we shouldn't be, in Lebanon, you shouldn't be asking Tehran or Damascus or the United States or Tel Aviv how we should govern ourselves. Um, how do you expect, how should, how should we do that when Lebanese people as a whole do not tend to think for themselves and tend to generally be mouthpieces of their leaders and of Tehran and of Damascus and of Tel Aviv and of Washington, D.C.? Look, I always thought that it would have been a good idea if the French had not divided Lebanon off from Syria, because Syria might be, because, because Syria might be a democracy, uh, you see. But I'd, the only way I can answer this is this. My father, who was much older than my mother, fought at the end of the First World War. He was in the Third Battle of the Somme and ended the war on the night of the 11th of November 1918 in a little village called Leuvencourt, in a little house which he once identified for me when I was a little boy. And I've gone back and knocked on the front door and met the great-granddaughter of the old lady who used to look after him. In 17 months that followed the end of my father's war, the First World War, we, the victors, who were primarily the British and the French, drew the borders of Northern Ireland, Yugoslavia, and most of the Middle East. And I have spent my entire professional career in Belfast, in Sarajevo, in Baghdad, and Beirut, and Palestine, in quotation marks, in Israel, watching all the people in those borders burn. I think at some point, you need a collective leadership in the Arab world which will take real decisions. I don't mean the Arab League. I don't mean more committees, which we'll report later, maybe. That's, that's rubbish. I don't know where it's going to come from. You mean a third option? As to oh, God, that sounds like CNN. Um, <laughs> okay, I understand. Yes, we all, I do too. I, I don't know. All I can say is that, you know, when you create frontiers, something strange happens. It's very difficult to get rid of them. Even if they're totally false, even if they're drawn by some guy. Look at the Durran line. Mortimer Durran drew, drew it between Afghanistan and Pakistan. There isn't a single Pushtun I've ever met who believes it exists. It is, it's the border. Afghanistan doesn't accept it. One day, I actually was wandering around near, was it Ch Chemin? I can't remember the name of the, the town. The park. I actually walked into Afghanistan and didn't know I was there until I found a police station with an Afghan flag on it. You know? And this is what the Americans call the porous border. Another line, porous, right? How many times have you seen porous border? Hands up, how many times? Everybody's seen porous border. It's another of our cliches. But, you know, you don't recognize these borders, understandably so, but you can't get rid of them. It's like the checkpoints in Beirut. Every time a militia was defeated, another checkpoint came in exactly the spot where they had a checkpoint. And now the Lebanese army checkpoints in Lebanon are exactly the spots where the militias had the checkpoints in the Civil War. Little frontiers within bigger frontiers, which were drawn by us. Carry on, last bit of question from you. Well, I, I do agree with your um, greater Syrian perspective. However, don't you think that speaking now is a bit retroactive? And that now that there's a border there, it's a legitimate border. To between Syria and Lebanon? Between Syria and Lebanon, it's a legitimate border. It's a yeah, recognized border by the United Nations. And if we're going to have any, if we're going to have any progress in the future, that border needs to be recognized, respected, and protected. Oh, it's recognized, all right, especially by the smugglers, because they make the biggest money out of it, because they go backwards and forwards with the total permission of the authorities of both sides. Is it recognized in Damascus? Look, well, I noticed when I went 
through the other day, there's a, a Syrian flag in a road parallel to Hamra. The embassy has opened. I, I don't know if they've announced who the new ambassador is going to be. I gather that the Lebanese are sending an ambassador called Mr. Hori, who's a Christian, to Damascus. And I gather that the Syrian ambassador may well be a woman called Mrs. Hori, who's a Christian being sent to Beirut. Isn't it such a lovely place, Syrian Lebanon? They really get it right. I don't know if that's correct, because I've been out of Lebanon for, what, nine, eight days now, but that was the last story I heard. Um, look, I don't believe you believe in these borders. Not the Lebanese, not the, I don't mean you personally, I'm not, no, no, no. I, I don't believe in that. Okay, but I don't believe in the regimes that are there either. And I would no, I can understand that. Look, you live in a fantasy world. Most of the people, Mahmoud Abbas has a phantom government. <laughs> and Obama rings him up. <laughs> phantom government, just so he puts you through, sir. You know? I mean, it's amazing. And that's what it is, it's, it's total fantasy. Um, and the Arabs don't believe in this. And you don't believe in your borders. And I often go wandering along in Bull. I'm always sniffing around to see where the Syrian Third Army Brigade is. And you know where it is. It's, it's, it's just above Hermel. So I often go sniffing around. And sometimes I find I've walked across a ditch and I'm on the wrong side of the border. So I go back the other side again. I don't take them seriously either. That's the problem. We don't take them seriously either. But we want them there because that way we control you. Can you let me creep out so I can get to the book stand for the few people unwise enough to buy any book I publish? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Right, I'm going to get out. Yes. I'll take the mic. How are you? Are you can, you take it off, can you take it off outside? Let me get out, will you? Take it off outside. Come with me. Come with me.